So good morning to each of you on this Palm Sunday. Pastor Debbie and Bob Fletcher and Dee Dee Yancer and myself hope that you are staying safe and well at home. We certainly miss all of you and so look forward to being together with you in person at a later time. But for now, let us once again enter into this time of worship together. Imagine that you were there on that Palm Sunday so long ago with Jesus and the disciples and the crowd. It was the Holy Jewish Festival of the Passover and celebration was in the air. People came from far and wide to Jerusalem, the holy city. They were filled with joy and expectation as they gathered to remember what God had done centuries earlier to free them from slavery in Egypt. Children played in the streets. Extended families and friends pitched tents together. Music played. The week of the festival was just beginning. What few people knew was that a parade with the itinerant prophet, Jesus and his disciples, was forming on the edge of the town. And soon many of them joined the parade, hailing him as the new king of Israel. Just as today. 
today, God is going to use these very palms, our hands, to touch others and transform their lives through each of us. Thanks be to God. Our scripture this morning comes from the 21st book of Matthew, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! High Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So as you know, today begins Holy Week, uh, the time every year when we remember the whole story of the last week of Jesus' earthly life. And I know that you all know the story very well, beginning with the story from our scripture this morning of this Palm Sunday, as we have come to call it, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and many of the Jewish people hailed him as the new king of Israel. And then moving to the story of Jesus overturning the tables of the money changers in the temple and coming into increasing conflict with both the religious establishment and the Roman government of the day. And then moving to the story of Jesus spending this intimate time with his closest friends, the disciples, and sharing a final meal with them, followed in rapid progression, you remember, of Jesus pouring his heart out in prayer to God in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then being betrayed and arrested and tried and sentenced, and beaten, and tortured, and crucified, and buried, and then rising again on the third day. I know that you all know this story so very well, so much so that I know you know a lot of the details of the specific names of places and people within the story. But as I was thinking about this whole story, this last week, meditating on it, this multifaceted picture of Jesus started forming in my own mind. So let me ask you this morning, as you think about all that Jesus walked through in that holy week so long ago, what do you see? As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I certainly see him pouring himself out in love to the whole world at every turn that week. 
but I also see him filled with deep sorrow over the, both the religious uh, establishment and the Roman government that were basically colluding together to sanction this system of economic injustice that was hurting way too many of God's children at that time. I see him filled with deep sorrow over life's inherent unfairness and injustice, but I also see him as being the most honest and deeply spiritual, both with himself and with God, person who has ever lived. I also see him nonviolently standing up to the powers that be at the time ultimately revealing that any form of violence or coercion in response to life's great injustices is never simply God's way. But finally, exactly because of his vulnerability and his willingness to surrender, and died to himself long before actually dying on the cross. Ultimately, completely surrendering himself over to God's love and mercy, I see Jesus demonstrating what true courage really is. And that's what I want to encourage us with today. Obviously, in light of this ongoing crisis that we're all walking through together, in light of this continuing uncertain time that we're walking through together, I want to encourage us to face this upcoming Holy Week and the weeks and likely months that are yet to come with courage. And by courage, I don't mean some kind of macho, stick out your chest, shake your fist kind of thing. I don't mean some kind of foolish bravado where we ignore, for example, all the health and safety guidelines of our health care and government officials. Instead, I mean the Jesus kind of courage that does take responsibility for doing absolutely everything we possibly can to help ourselves and to help others, but at the same time also ultimately admits our own powerlessness and then ultimately uh, trust ourselves into God's care that God is always and ever with us. I mean the Jesus kind of courage that comes from deep within and therefore allows us to face even our greatest fears even death, especially death, with a peace that passes all understanding. I mean the Jesus kind of courage that can pray the prayer as he did in the garden. If it be your will, O God, let this cup please pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I mean the Jesus kind of courage that can look at that terrible cross and endure the pain and suffering of feeling forsaken, but ultimately knows that nothing could be further from the truth and therefore commends oneself and one's spirit into God's hands. Into God's hands, Jesus prayed, I commend my spirit. I mean the kind of Jesus courage that gains life by losing life, by dying a thousand deaths to oneself before actually dying. You see, together we're living through something that none of us have ever experienced before, and I'm hoping and praying that we'll be able to face whatever is asked of us to face in the coming weeks and months with the kind of courage that certainly Jesus demonstrated over the course of his life and ministry, but especially during this Holy Week. At this point, none of us know what we might be asked to bear in terms of friends 
or family members or even ourselves who might contract the virus and become sick. None of us knows the economic repercussions that are going to come in terms of people's livelihoods. None of us knows the depth and the extent of the loss that we may be asked to bear in the coming weeks and months. But it seems to me even so that there couldn't be a much bigger brick over our heads or a much brighter neon flashing sign, if you will, for navigating this exact crisis than Holy Week of all weeks coinciding at the exact same time that the pandemic seems to be reaching its climax. We can indeed face whatever is asked of us in the coming weeks and months with courage because Jesus has shown us the way. Ironically, the pandemic is actually showing us that even though life basically came to a screeching halt for so many a couple of weeks ago, even though there has been the death of our usual routines, even though it does seem that greater loss is looming large on the horizon, we have nonetheless been learning new ways, not only to be the church together, but also, I think, to be global citizens together. As you well know, a whole lot more phone calls are being made today. A whole lot more cards and letters and emails and care packages are being sent. Not to mention, I think, a whole lot more generosity of spirit is being felt and given by us and by people everywhere. We are all in this together, literally all around the world. We say this often, but I think it bears repeating that one of the recurring refrains throughout Scripture is do not be afraid or fear not. We remember that Jesus said this often. Memorably, he said one day to the disciples when they were out on the sea in this boat, in this raging storm, not knowing what in the world was going to happen, do not be afraid, Jesus said. As some of the translations say that Jesus said, take courage. To have courage is the same as not being afraid, but not because we're macho, you see but instead, as people of faith, what we know is that nothing, not even the coronavirus, not even all the losses that we have experienced in our life already, or the losses that we may be asked to bear in the weeks and months that lie ahead, nothing can ever separate us from God and God's love. Many of you will uh, remember that when she was diagnosed with a glioblastoma, which is the absolute worst possible brain cancer you can possibly get, our dear friend and dear sister here at St. John's, Jane Walter, almost immediately said in response to that diagnosis, I'm going to lay this burden down and I'm not going to pick it back up again. That, my friends, is Jesus' kind of courage. The kind of courage that wrestles through to get to undivided trust, to complete surrender and to quiet and confident peace within oneself that indeed, no matter what, God will never let us go. Take courage, my friends. Do not be afraid, even and exactly at this very time. Thanks be to God. Amen.
And now we come to a moment of prayer, and I invite you to take a deep breath and hold it and let it out, and let us be in prayer together. Gracious God, on this holy day of Palm Sunday, we have so many mixed feelings inside of us. We remember your son's triumphant entrance into Jerusalem with the people shouting praises and waving palm branches. And we join them with our own praises. And yet, we remember too that this wonderful parade for your son becomes another kind of parade before officials and the booing crowds. And yet, we know that it is because of his choosing to enter Jerusalem and taking the path he knew he was taking, there is hope, there is grace, and there is love for all. Lord, enter our lives, our cities, our countries once again today. Heal us, Lord. Transform us. Renew us. And draw us closer to you in this journey into Holy Week. Empower us with strength and courage and with the assurance that you are with us, using each of us to make a difference in this world. Lord, we know you hear our prayers, so hear now our prayers lifted up in silence. Jesus Christ calls us into oneness with you as we pray the prayer that he taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so now may this holy week, observed in our separation and distance from one another, still bring us closer to one another and to God. Take courage, be of good cheer, love and serve the Lord, and may the grace and peace of God be with you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>